Hi everybody, thanks for joining us today for the latest in our Sontech webinar series. Today our topic is quantifying flood events using acoustic data. I'm Janice Lansfeld, I'm a product manager here at Sontech. And I'm Shua Fan, application engineer here at Sontech. Uh, here's a little brief overview of our agenda today. Before we get into the application studies, I'd like to review why this topic is relevant and, and why I think acoustics matter right now. Uh, and the case studies include uh, four that we'll focus on. Um, uh, and at the end, we'll do questions and answers. And as usual, please, we encourage your participation. So type in questions mm -hmm. as they arise in the chat box there. And we'll try to get to all of them. But if not, we always uh, take all of those questions, type them up in a document, and distribute that to everybody after the webinar is over. So why acoustics? Why now? Why this topic? So there's just some statistics. Um, for example, from 2017, uh, the, the costliest record in terms of storm damage, and not only the past, but the future, the different studies predict um, things like threefold increases in extreme wet weather over 35% of North America, Europe, and East Asia. So not just extreme weather, extreme wet weather. Mm -hmm. um, so these extreme events, they provide an opportunity to take a look at what we're doing currently with our monitoring networks and hone that perhaps more for flooding applications um, and from a scientific perspective but you know maybe even more importantly for social benefit how can we help people in flooding events with these data so the point of this webinar is for if you're an experienced acoustic user to take the tools you already have and apply them better um, for this application or if you're a little bit new to acoustics or a certain part of what we're going to talk about take the first steps and um, apply them in flooding uh, applications. Here's kind of a little mind map of uh, the webinar where we're going to go with the idea of uh, and this continuum of flood monitoring is just something I, I coined to say essentially we can start at the very beginning and have no information uh, to do analysis and, and understand and make predictions. Uh, or we can look at weather, weather data, weather forecast, or a historical hydrograph. We can sort of move up and be collecting real-time level data, which I think a lot of people are familiar with. But that's just real-time. It's a what is right now. Um, we can calibrate that, perhaps, with some high-resolution discharge data. Uh, we could take another step and collect real-time velocity data along with our stage data. Uh, and then maybe putting all of that together, I would say the most advanced level is to take this data and create predictive um, uh, information about level velocity, discharge, volume, and where that water's going to go. So um, you might be anywhere along this spectrum if you're a water professional, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll hit points relevant to, to all of it. So the first case studies we're going to talk about are from Hurricane Irma which unfortunately I think we all remember. It was the strongest Atlantic hurricane on record. And uh, there were evacuations throughout the Caribbean, the Gulf, um, and, and Florida notably. There were 134 <coughs> lives lost, and just in the US alone, $50 billion in damages. Uh, and you can see in this graphic, that's sort of a, what NOAA does to predict the weather. So what uh, we're going to hone in on is a, a portion of Florida, uh, in central Florida, just adjacent to Orlando, where you know Walt Disney World is and hotbed of tourism. Uh, it's called Kissimmee, Florida. And uh, this is a news clip from the flooding that happened from Hurricane Irma in, in Kissimmee. And the real, just the real life impact that this can have, there was a retirement village that was in, uh, um, impacted by this flooding and th in the news clip there of course the county was was working hard on, on evacuating people and keeping them notified um, and th the, the city of Kissimmee actually has a very extensive monitoring network but even at the time um, in this news article the county was was quoted as saying you know we're monitoring the water levels in real time but it's impossible to accurately predict when they will recede and perhaps in the course of this webinar, we can sort of take the next steps of, 
of addressing this sort of very logical question. So here's what the monitoring network in Kissimmee looks like. Uh, it's a network of uh, 24 uh, monitoring sites. And we'll just talk about the Sontech instrumentation, the acoustics. Of course, there's level and there's some telemetry information there as well. But the, the Sontech instruments are what are the, called the Sontech Sidelooker and the Sontech IQ. And then they use another instrument called the River Surveyor M9 um, to manage these, these sites, the data at these sites. But before we get a little bit more into detail, uh, Shu is going to pause for a second and catch everybody up if you're unfamiliar with these different pieces of equipment. Yeah, so uh, we, we usually group our equipment into two different categories, instantaneous and continuous discharge measurements. So why don't we start with the continuous monitoring first. So a lot of these uh, instruments are known as ADVMs, or Acoustic Doppler Velocity Meters. Those are usually referred to as the side-looking instruments. And we also have the Sontech IQ series that's on the top part of the slide. Or the uplookers. Uplookers, mm -hmm. right. Uh, these are mounted on the bottom, looking up. And so these uh, continuous monitoring instruments are meant to basically be set up in the field, configured. Um, often they're connected to a data logger that brings in data um, remotely to, to your um, computer station. Or you, can, um, you have the option of recording internal data within these systems. And so they're meant for setting up, um, configuring, and then you are basically going to leave the site and let these instruments run continuously. In contrast, uh, the instantaneous measurements include systems like the Flow Tracker, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, or the River Surveyor M9 or S5 systems. And these instantaneous systems are meant for you to go out into the river, either you wade into the river, you're on a boat, or you use some sort of floating platform. Uh, you're going to take a very high resolution discharge measurement, but it's going to be instantaneous, so one snapshot in time. So you're not going to be there continuously, but you get a very high resolution mm -hmm. discharge measurement. Okay, now if any, you have any questions about the instruments, we breezed over that really fast. Just, just type those questions in and, and we'll, uh, we'll get back to them. So back to the monitoring network here in Kissimmee, they, they use all of these instruments. And in this case, we're talking about their, um, the flooding uh, uh, event. But really, the, the primary um, and probably even more important driver of this network is stormwater reporting. Uh, for water quality purposes. And there's um, some very interesting work being done in Kissimmee in terms of stormwater and water quality. We're not going to get into that, but that's, these are two things that are kind of related. Um, and I think uh, in this case was beneficial because they had the stormwater network set up. It also provided flooding data. All right, so zoning in a little bit more on what we're going to talk about. Here is uh, a site called Shingle Creek. And on the left-hand side, you can see uh, it in its normal stage. Um, there's a nice catwalk going out to a piling where the instruments are mounted. And then on the right-hand side, we can see what it looked like during the flooding. And you can see that entire catwalk was almost underwater and sort of the, the magnitude of that water level rise. Oh. So what kind of data did we get from this instrument? Uh, this is a snapshot of the instrument software. The instrument in this case was the Sontex Sidelooker. So you have those two big round beams that are your velocity acoustic beams. And as the graphic shows, there's a vertical beam on top um, that sends a signal up to the surface, bounces a reflection down, and tells us the water level. So in this graph, we're showing velocity data in red uh, in the x direction, as that arrow in the upper right hand corner indicates. Um, that's the positive x direction. And then the blue arrow is a cross stream velocity. So it's, it's important to note, I think, uh, in this case, that these instruments give you horizontal, in a, a horizontal plane, the water velocity data, not just the water going one direction, which under no normal circumstances for a normal discharge measurement is important. But maybe when there's flooding, directionality becomes a bigger question. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to point that out, too. Uh, so I'll, I'll point everybody's attention to what we have circled, which is the flooding event. 
And you can see uh, at the point in time where there was dramatic rise in water velocity, uh, we went from, say, 1.6 feet per second, oh, more than double to 4.5 feet per second. Uh, and the water levels went from 3 to almost 8.5, so a good 5 foot tall load of water coming through that site. Um, those are probably the two, the two uh, pr parameters of interest, but interestingly, uh, down at the uh, bottom of the top graph, you see the blue line, which remember is the cross stream velocity, and when this flood of water pushed through, it changed the direction, so there was a significant um, component to the cross stream velocity too. In other words, it wasn't just going straight down downstream in this case. So mm -hmm. just an example of the interesting information you can get uh, in the flooding situation. And Janice, if I may just ask a quick mm -hmm. question. Um, I know that during flooding events there's quite a bit of debris coming down. Mm. Uh, what if you know this debris covers the instrument and you mentioned this vertical beam getting the depth right. uh, measurement for you? Right, that's a good point. It, during flooding it's not uncommon, it's more common to see debris and just like any sensor, if it's blocked um, by something, it might interfere with that acoustic vertical beam, but these instruments have pressure sensors as well, mm -hmm. so there's a way in which they, they back each other up, and you, would, you will still have pressure data in case the vertical beam goes out, although the vertical beam is, is um, the more accurate one, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. All right, so that was, as she would pointed out, the continuous measurement instrument used at this, uh, in this network. So also in this network, they use the River Surveyor M9 to go out and uh, calibrate, so to speak, or take instantaneous discharge measurements of how much water we have at these sites. So we have a before and after graphic. On top is the before, um, normal 20 meter uh, cross section in length. And you can see during the flooding, we, um, uh, we went from depths of two and a half meters down to almost four, so meter, meter and a half of, of extra water that was um, added. And the track, so we add water on top and that water spreads and we went from a track of 20 meters to almost 50. Uh, most of that being on the left bank there where the flooded area uh, occurred. And of course, we can see also the higher velocities uh, that happened in the channel at the time. Mm -hmm. so it's a brief overview of, of how to look at these discharge data in, in flooding. So now we're going to move on to another example that happened during Hurricane Irma uh, on the other side of Florida, on the west coast of Florida, near Tampa, um, in a site called the Crystal River. And it was an interesting news story also uh, that what happened at, in Tampa in advance of the hurricane, as it approached, the winds, uh, the very strong winds, blew in a direction such that there was this reverse storm surge. The winds blew the water offshore and essentially drained Tampa Bay. So there's that news, news image there showing people walking out into Tampa Bay in disbelief. <laughs> uh, now, we didn't have instrumentation in the bay, but we had instrumentation in a river, the Crystal River, which is um, north of there. And what we can see in, in the data, uh, I have circled here in, in yellow, uh, the purple line, the solid purple line is the water velocities, and the, the dashed red line is the water level or the stage. Uh, so you can see when the wind starts, you know, blowing and this sort of um, reverse storm surge starts happening, this normal tidal signature kind of gets overpowered and we essentially just have an ebb uh, that keeps pushing more and more water out till it reaches this low around the, the 11th. Um, and then finally, the, there, there were concerns in Tampa Bay that there was going to be some big after effect and some concerns about flooding when this reverse storm surge finally reversed again. Mm -hmm. um, but we do see the on the 11th, the, the site in the Crystal River, that um, it kind of came back in a very sudden fashion and there, were, uh, there was like a meter of difference here mm -hmm. that happened. And at the same time, we can watch the water level changing. We have this velocity data, so we can also see that, once again, the tidal signature was sort of overpowered by this, this, this wind effect and it 
became a, a completely solid positive um, x velocity. Mm -hmm. So this is another fascinating example of you know what, what we know happened, but well, how bad? What what was the magnitude? What was the actual the time that these things were happening in the data? All right, moving now, um, we have um, a fascinating example in the UK uh, from Storm Desmond that was uh, in the um, winter of 2015. And interestingly, I wanted to, to mention that it was tied to atmospheric river phenomena. And I know this, this is the term I'm hearing more and more about. And what's just fascinating to me is that as hydrologists, we, were, we gather data and we analyze water that's flowing on the, on the surface of the earth. But we're coming to understand that there are literal rivers in the sky, too, that carry moisture and uh, how these things interact, I think, is going to be an, an interesting area of research that mm -hmm. goes on in the future. So Storm Desmond was tied to that, and uh, what we're going to come back down to Earth and uh, <laughs> look at some of the data that we uh, gathered with the Sontech instruments. Of course, another historic event broke UK rainfall records, significant um, infrastructure losses and evacuations, as that picture shows. Mm -hmm. So here's some photos just to take you on site to where the UK Environment Agency had to contend with this flood and, and do their gaugings. Uh, on the upper left-hand corner, you, you see the picture of a site called Bywell on the Tyne River. You can see that the water level has come up over the tree line. And all things considered, um, this actually was a pretty good site because there was a cableway. Mm -hmm. um, and historically, it just was known to be just sort of a good container for, for channeling um, excessive flows. But you might not always be so lucky. Uh, and in that case, um, I heard from folks in Hurricane Harvey, for example, that um, use satellite data, you know, just sort of memory on what worked before, and even Google Earth can help you in situations when your cross section is just not normal looking anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the, on the right-hand side and on the lower left, we have pictures of the torrent board and the hydro board. And just look at the water surface. You can imagine in flood conditions, it's going to be more, more turbulent. There's even a little bit of white water going on. Uh, and so we'll talk about a little bit more in the data and what that looks like. But you're going to want to do the best you can to keep the nose of the instrument down so they've weighted it with a bomb or, or in, uh, with a set of weights. Is that what that little yellow thing is? Yeah, that's what that is. Mm -hmm. And so to the degree you can keep the nose pointed down, um, you can prevent a lot of excessive motion, and you can prevent ex excessive air or cavitation from covering the transducer face while the measurement's happening. Again, if something's blocking the acoustic face, it's going to interfere with your measurement. Um, you can also push the instrument down um, so it's sitting lower in the water um, mm -hmm. on the floating platform or on uh, on your boat if you're using one. So another a little story that happened, this, uh, this torrent board, the lower right-hand corner, you know, even the most experienced users uh, have to contend with these difficult conditions. And in the high winds, the, the torrent board was sort of lifted into the air, almost like a kite, and then flipped over. And then the enormous pressure, the enormous force of the water um, caused it to break free, and it floated downstream. Wow. Did they so get it back the, at least? Yeah, they got it back. Um, they might have even been using a GPS tracker, I think, which oh, is another okay. little, little tip you can, you can take. Mm -hmm. um, so they had no idea where it was, but they were able to recover it. And from what I understand, it was working just fine. Um, I guess the, the last point I want to hit on before we look at the data um, in terms of field use and getting the most out of the instrument is it just helps to have a plan. I heard this from folks operating in Hurricane Harvey too. Uh, when you're on site, when you're responding in an emergency, there's really not a lot of time for experimentation. So um, have a contingency plan, have a few sites picked out, know how you're going to uh, rig the gear. In the case of, of this torrent board, um, the feedback was perhaps they could have connected it at two, two points on the board or doubled up mm -hmm. on the line or something just to try to do a little bit extra to, to account for these high winds and forces that are going to be happening. OK, so here's the data. Now, before we get bogged down in, in, in too many of the, because you can see a lot of data from a river surveyor, but this ultimately is, is the transect. And just look at the magnitudes 
we're talking about here. That's crazy. Oh, that's four, over four, four meters a second. Over four meters Jeez. a second. So you can imagine the difficulty um, they were in. Uh, and a, a thing to point out, though, is we have full, over four meters a second here in the red area, but over here on the flooded area where it's purple, you have zero. Mm -hmm. So these are pretty, pretty big extremes in terms of velocity. Uh, so we wanted to take a second, too, and talk about how we're able to do that and what the instrument's actually doing mm -hmm. uh, when yeah, we capture it's, this. It's great you mentioned that, Janice, because the, um, I know this word smart pulse mm. floats around um, in a lot of our literature, and I just want to describe it a little bit more. So smart pulse is um, a method or algorithm that we use to cycle through the different frequencies uh, in the M9 system, for example, and three different ping types. And so on the fly, the system is going to automatically switch among the different combinations so that you always get the, um, the optimum uh, velocity measurement and accuracy there. I would, you know, some of us might remember that in the past, going from shallow to deep or fast water to slow water might require you to stop and start or even use a different instrument altogether. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so how, what method did they use when they were collecting the data? So again, you, um, you have an M9 instrument, there's different ways to use it. Well, they use the stationary me measurement method in this case. Why might they have uh, done that? Well, in flooding conditions and fast moving flows, it's possible that s sediment is uh, not steady on the bottom. It's being suspended, it's being pushed. So if you have a moving bed, um, the instrument would otherwise have to account for that. Um, with the higher velocities in the boat motion, there's just more variables going on because any motion of the boat is going to reflect as motion in the water by the acoustic signal, and then we have to separate that out with calculations, mm -hmm. which the instrument can do, but it's just another variable to handle in these erratic conditions. Uh, another reason is that when you're doing the stationary measurement method, you're, it's, it's actually more like a flow tracker or um, a weight engaging. You're stopping, measuring for a certain amount of time, say 60 seconds, stopping, moving over, staying stationary for another 60 seconds, and so on. So you have more control over starting and stopping. And if you're noticing some cavitation, or you could, you could do the measurement over. A little bit harder to, to notice those things and to stop when the boat is doing a constant line. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing to consider at this, at, you know, this particular site, there, um, there was conveniently a, a cableway, uh, but in, <laughs> in flooding conditions, conceivable, you won't be able to set up a tagline. So uh, one feature that we offer now is the ability to GPS position while you're doing your stationary measurement without a tagline. Another thing that helped the folks in Hurricane Harvey is manual configuration mode. So Shua mentioned Smart Pulse, that is the intelligence of the instrument to, to adapt itself to changing conditions. But um, when conditions are really erratic, maybe we just want to leave the instrument brains out and just tell it I want a certain number of, of cells in my profile mm -hmm. at a certain depth. And that, makes, um, that just makes the, uh, the process more predictable. Mm -hmm. And specifically, the manual configuration mode will maintain one ping type. So you're mm -hmm. not switching That's from one right. to another. All right, so this is what the operators would have seen in the field, or this is what you would see in post-processing. We, we could do a whole training uh, week on what river surveyor data there are, but I've, I've sort of highlighted uh, with labels what we're looking at uh, for, this, for purposes here. So on the upper left, we have a signal strength plot um, showing the four beams. There's four velocity beams active at any one time, and they should all match in, in intensity roughly and show reflection near the bottom where it's heading an echo off the bottom. Uh, in the upper right, we have a plot of the velocity profile. There's a little unmeasured section at the top. That's the blanking distance for the acoustics. There's the measured area in blue. And there's another blanking distance at the bottom. So there's uh, an extrapolation that's done there to give you your velocity profile um, per uh, station. And then as we move from right to left or left to right and gather our stations, they show up there in the colorful stations plot. So one of the things I wanted to point out 
that's relevant here in, in these sort of erratic flooding conditions is the depth reference that was chosen. The uh, river surveyor has a vertical beam, so a, a, a depth measurement beam. But in this case, they chose to use the four beam average of the velocity beams that also get a reflection off the bottom. Now that's because the, when the instrument's pitching and rolling, or maybe even getting some cavitation, if you have four beams and getting an average, it's going to be less susceptible to cutouts or wild changes in um, depth, so that we have what looks like a more representative, uh, smooth bottom plot. Mm -hmm. So just note that that was one thing they did specifically <coughs> in, in, in flooding here. So remember when we were talking about it, um, the, the, the turbulence at the surface and how we, they were using the weights to keep the nose down, um, which, which actually did really well, but there was one station, it was station 15, where we could see some cavitation. So I wanted to point out here in the data, this is what you would see if you were um, seeing some cavitation. So most likely you would see one or more beams separating out from the rest and th that intensity goes down because the signal is being compromised. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out because it was uh, of more concern in flooding. So lastly, uh, this is also a uh, greater chance of this happening when you're operating in flood conditions. Your flood area is going to expand and you might have to section uh, the, the transect into smaller pieces and then sum them, which is what they did in this case uh, at, for the, um, on the Tyne River. Uh, so they divided it into cross sections. So there's a cross section A, a cross section B, and a cross section uh, C, and then uh, summed them all together. Uh, in Hurricane Harvey, they did this as well, and some of the, you know, the, the edges were four miles away from the main channel. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't always have to be ADCP data stitched together either. In, in the case of Harvey, they had a, they had a few um, ADCP transects. And then over in the trees, uh, they had to just use a mechanical meter. It was just mm -hmm. too difficult to get in there. So mechanical meter, ADCP, sometimes in these, these, these extreme conditions, you do what it takes. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the punchline here is that what's normally a 45 cubic meter per second uh, discharge in this historic event was over 1,200 cubic meters uh, per second. And the stage actually peaked at uh, seven meters. All right, so uh, we're, we've showed you what the instruments can do, what kind of data you can get, how to maximize the data collection in the field. Uh, we're going to move on now to, well, what can you do with these data? How are they useful? Uh, and for that, Shua is first going to show everybody how to pronounce the name of this river properly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so as Janice mentioned, I'm going to first be talking about how to use the data that Janice talked about to um, process the data and different techniques to improve your discharge measurement quality. And then some possibilities later on for actually predictive um, values of the data. So Jan to Janice's question, flooding in the Yangtze River. Um, so the Yangtze River is actually the longest river in Asia. It's the sixth largest um, by discharge volume. And interestingly, in Chinese, most people refer to this river as the Changjiang, mm. which directly translates to Long River. <laughs> so many of you have probably heard of this river, um, seen photos of beautiful you know, river cruises through the mountains. Uh, Three Gorges Dam is on this river. Mm -hmm. So what many of you have probably not heard of is that almost every year there are pretty devastating uh, floods resulting from the rainy season. And uh, for example, in the summer of 2004 alone, there were over a thousand deaths and you know, there was flooding, landslides, mudslides. Uh, this is actually the highest rainfall recorded in, in 200 years uh, here. Wow. So the actual site that we'll be discussing today is indicated by that star in the lower right-hand side. Uh, so these are just photos of the actual site and the installation process. And if you look at the top left photo, you see um, the various uh, workers from the Yangtze River Water Conservancy Commission. 
and they're installing an Argonaut um, SL500. So this is our lower frequency instrument. It's meant to basically um, put out acoustic pulses that go further away. So the maximum range is about 120 meters in the horizontal mm -hmm. here. And you'll notice that they have built a cage type system around it and they've been careful not to block these transducers here. Mm -hmm. So as Janice mentioned, anything blocking the transducers will have an impact on the data quality. Uh, so this is something that you can think about. You know, there's uh, quite a bit of debris coming, coming down rivers when there's flooding events and um, just trying to prevent debris from hanging up on the actual instrument itself. Uh, so the people are here working and next to them here is this white staff gauge. And to the right here, the photo on the right, actually shows the staff gauge going that all the way incredible. up. That is incredible. Yeah, so this just <laughs> shows the scale of the, the changes and the stages that they expect on this river. So obviously they're installing at low flows here and then at high flows the water can actually uh, peak up to where this building starts. So that's pretty incredible. Um, so before we look at the actual data from the site, I just wanted to talk briefly about the theory behind some of the methods that we use to calculate discharge and report it in a real-time manner. Uh, so this is kind of hydrology 101, so bear with me. Uh, first of all, most people will recognize and use the stage discharge relationship. <clears throat> so the main assumptions here are that we have steady flow and uniform flow. So steady flow means that the flow doesn't change very much over time, and then uniform flow means that if when we're going across the river, the velocities at one end versus the middle versus the other end are, are pretty much the same. So you can already kind of imagine that during a flooding type situation, one or both of these assumptions might not apply. That's right. However, uh, this method, the stage discharge relationship, often you know you're using your rating curves basically. Um, this is used most widely at U.S. gauging sites as well as around the world simply because it's uh, one of the cheapest, simplest uh, solutions to install and maintain, and also the data processing afterwards is probably the simplest um, in terms of work. Mm -hmm. So, when using the stage discharge relationship, there are complications that occur and they make the situation um, more difficult. And so some of these will include the non-uniform flow conditions, uh, so on the right, I have an example of data showing non-uniform flow. And this is actually data that's coming from one of the Sontec SL, or side-looking systems. It's mounted in an irrigation canal in Yuma, Arizona. So kind of like the picture in the lower left, is exactly. that correct? Yes. That looks pretty uh, normal to me. It does, and these are controlled flows that don't change very much over time, and you would expect a very nice rating curve for this site. However, uh, you have the x velocities in the red line to the right, and as you move up the plot, you are moving away from the system. So you can see that we start out with higher velocities, and towards the opposite end of the bank, we see lower velocities. So uh, this is a classic example of non-uniform flow in a situation where you would expect uniform mm -hmm. flow. Um, this could be caused by many factors. There are dams um, upstream. There's a small sort of offshoot just downstream of this mm -hmm. site. So this is you know, a prime example of where if you just had a stage measurement, you wouldn't know about this. And so you really need um, a horizontal measurement, a profile across the stream in order to tell um, whether you have the situation or not. This brings to mind a famous quote from our friend Art Schmidt, who's credited with saying, the river didn't go to school. <laughs> it doesn't know what equations you're using or what it's supposed to conform right. to. So in a sense, you have to school the river. <laughs> <laughs> so other complications to your normal rating curves can be you know, backwater eddies, flashy events like flooding, storms, or even tidal cycles, uh, vegetation, uh, tree branches, logs, big boulders, or tributaries, or dams, or other hydrological structures, weirs, culverts, that sort of thing. So this big list of, of different factors, um, you can imagine that you know, any number of these factors really occurs on almost every site that, that you can find. And so um, it will be important, especially in these flooding conditions, to really take care to correct for these. One of the primary methods that's used in more complex sites is called velocity indexing. 
and let's go into detail about that. So velocity indexing requires direct measurements of velocity, discharge, area, and stage. So if you compare with your normal stage discharge relationship, you see that you have twice as many measurements to take for this method. However, this will give you greater accuracy at these complex mm -hmm. sites. And I won't go into detail um, you know, in the actual method. There's quite a bit of literature out there that you are welcome to look at. There um, will be some references at the end of this presentation for you to look at. So just a brief overview of indexing. Mm -hmm. The idea is, as we mentioned before, we have these instantaneous versus continuous measurements. And instantaneous measurements, again, will just give you a snapshot. But what you really want is a continuous measurement in real time during a flooding right. event. So the indexing idea uh, basically brings the quality of the instantaneous measurement. You use that to calibrate your continuous measurement so that you have a similar quality to the That's instantaneous right. discharges. Uh, finally, I just wanted to mention that we do have a software package called Flowpack. And you're not required to use this. There are many packages um, available for Some you Some people to use. are spreadsheet wizards. Yep, there you go. Uh, so this Flowpack software can be used basically to amass all your data together, do some processing, and, and get your velocity index for you for a given site. So going back to the data from the Yangtze River site, I just wanted to show the, the total discharge over time that was measured. And with indexing, it'll be very important to measure the discharge at multiple stages. So the best thing you can do is to measure across uh, many flooding events. At sites that are natural, this can take years sometimes. Uh, at sites that are more you know, irrigation or, or man-made or controlled, um, this can be done very easily. So an example here shows one flooding event, and you can see that the, the discharges go from you know, around 100 me cubic meters per second all the way to over 20,000 cubic meters per that second. That is incredible. It is. And actually at this site, the maximum that they've measured here is 44,000 cubic meters per second. And the maximum velocities they've measured here are around 7.22 meters a second. That is fast. Yes, so that'll definitely take you away. And then finally, what I wanted to mention was that when you use packages like Flowpack to get your index relationship, what you end up getting at the end is uh, basically a relationship with coefficients that you can use to apply to your actual data. And the simplest relationship you can get is by using one parameter. So this is a regression. Mm -hmm. And in this example, the simplest one is with um, the measured velocity. And if you bump that one step up, you can get more complex. You can add the stage variable there too. So you're assuming that your final discharge value depends on fluctuations in the stage and the velocity. And then you can go up from there. So you can use multiple parameters. I know the USGS likes to experiment with um, different parameters mm -hmm. to see what uh, the best fit is. So the point of that uh, is that this is an objective technique that basically uses regression and statistics to be mm -hmm. able to determine how to best or most accurately measure your discharge, especially for these complex sites or for flooding situations. And so another factor when you look at flooding events is what we call hysteresis. Uh, what is hysteresis? So on the left uh, top plot, I'm showing the hydrograph of a steady flow, so not changing very much over time. And you'll see that the velocity maximum, the discharge maximum, and the stage peak will be occurring at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, for unsteady flows, so basically flows that change very quickly in time, the hydrograph in the middle will show a velocity maximum that's leading or occurs before mm -hmm. the discharge maximum, which then occurs before the peak in the stage. Mm -hmm. And when you plot this data in a plot that shows discharge versus stage, you'll, instead of seeing the classic rating curve where you see a nice flat line for the rising limb of the flood, you'll see a different effect versus mm. the fall, a falling limb of the flood. Right. So this is kind of what hysteresis means, is that you go out and you see a different situation versus coming back in. 
So this is again something that we often see during flooding events. So let's dive right into the data here. Uh, first example is from Nashville, Tennessee. This was from a site operated in cooperation with the US Army Corps of Engineers. And they've mounted here some side looking instruments on these bridge pylons here. Mm -hmm. And during this historic flooding event in 2010, the stage actually peaked at 59 feet above normal. So this so is that's stadium. why the trailer <laughs> is flooding. Yes, the trailer, <laughs> poor trailer. Uh, so let's look at the data very quickly. The stage is plotted in this blue line here. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, we have the, the velocity in the pink line. And the stage peaks during this event right about here and the velocity will peak just before that here. And so the difference in time, the delta, is about 12 hours, so just keep that in mind. Next example, Texas flooding in 2006. And here again, they're using the long range or lower mm -hmm. frequency instrument just to get further out into the river. Data from this site, we've got the stage, again in blue, and the velocity in the pink. And the difference here between the stage peak and the velocity peak is about two and a half days. So what does this mean? Or how, how can you use this data? Mm -hmm. So just imagine that you are monitoring the stage during this flooding event, and you're at this point in time where we have uh, the rest of the data blacked out. So all you know at this point is that you've seen the stage rise. You don't know at what time your stages are going to peak and at That's what right. levels your stages are going to peak. However, if you're at this time and you've got velocity data also, you've already seen the peak in the velocity data come and go. Mm -hmm. If you know that for your site, you have two and a half days before you peak in your stage, you will have two and a half days basically to make your management decisions, to make evacuation calls, to send out emergency personnel. To predict when people might be able to return. Exactly. And so adding on this velocity data, not only are you measuring the flow directly, which gives you higher accuracy, mm -hmm. uh, this parameter can also be very valuable as an early warning system in these flooding events. Now you mentioned, Shua, the previous example was 12 hours, and this mm -hmm. was two and a half. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think some of the factors are that affect that? That's a great question. Uh, this is actually um, an area of active research, and mm -hmm. what's been shown so far is that the magnitude and the intensity of the flooding event, so how much precipitation you get and over what span of mm -hmm. time, uh, really affects the hysteretic um, variables here. And so this time lag will depend on just what type of storm you get. So even at the same site, you might get a different lag depending on you know, what, what sort of factors are involved here. Mm -hmm. And then this is just a sort of conceptual example. This is a conceptual model of a floodplain. And the first um, example here is just using a static inundation map. So that's without the hysteresis. That's assuming a steady flow. And the resulting floodplain that you get from this model is outlined in this blue line here. And then, if you add hysteresis into the model, so add this lag effect, um, it's called a dynamic inundation model, and you result in a floodplain basically outlined by this red dotted line. You see that the results are quite different. So this just really uh, shows the impact mm -hmm. of adding this sort of parameter into your, your modeling and into your data. And so if you were to take home one message from this webinar today, it's that adding hysteresis into your floodplain models and adding velocity data into your monitoring sites can potentially give you more accurate flood stage peak levels and timing. So remember when Janice mentioned in her uh, Hurricane Irma example where the officials said, oh, there's no way really to predict the peak levels or when the water is going to be receding. Well, actually, we're at the point where we may be able to mm -hmm. uh, predict when levels will be receding mm -hmm. here. So hopefully um, we've set out what, or we've done what we've set out to do, which is sort of provide a broad overview for what's driving um, uh, 
perhaps increased monitoring using acoustic instruments, and then gone through some of the tools um, in this webinar. So the River Surveyor, which is a mobile tool that can give you very high resolution data in a snapshot wherever you take it. Um, in contrast to the instant or excuse me, the continuous monitoring instruments that can be installed, delivering data 24/7 during a flood. Um, and unlike uh, just a stage sensor, can give you very useful velocity information, not only for more accurate data, but for predictive analysis um, that can help inform management decisions. Uh, so also, we hope to have given you some practical tools about if you have these instruments or if you get some of these instruments, get your hands on some of them, how to make the most of them during flood conditions, because it is not, it's not easy during flood conditions. Uh, but you still need to get good data. And then lastly, as, as Shua uh, drove home, uh, well, you know, if you have the data and if you're willing to do some analysis on it, uh, it will better inform your decision making. Mm -hmm. So that's our webinar review. Uh, we do have some special thanks to go through for the, the uh, customers that help us develop these examples. The City of Kissimmee, uh, Woolpert, their operators, John Fagens, at YSI Integrated Systems and Services, Corinne Downs at the USGS, Ian Downs at the UK Environment Agency, Lee Pimble uh, at our office in Europe, Keith Ging at the LCRA, Jenny Rast Oakley at the Environmental Institute of Houston, Stephen Chen at our office in China, and Marion Mustay at uh, the University of Iowa. I would like to say too that uh, we do have some references here, so if there's anything we mentioned that you want to research more on, there's a list here, uh, or just get in contact with us and, and we will help you out. Uh, as Shua mentioned, this is an ongoing topic of research and we think it's more and more relevant. So flooding is the theme for our International Users Conference and Regatta that's happening later in October of this year in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And I hope to see um, maybe more elaboration on some examples like this and uh, more participation from uh, people like you. If you are interested in doing some um, modeling or working in this area, we would love to hear from you. And uh, please consider uh, joining us at the conference. So with that, I think we can uh, move into some questions. Let's reel in the questions here. Um, maybe I can start with this one. Uh, what kind of velocities can you use the boat in? I'm guessing they mean the hydro board or the torrent board boats. Um, let's see. So with the torrent board and the hydro board, um, usually we would recommend around five meters a second. That's probably the maximum that those boats mm -hmm. can handle. But just keep in mind that you know once you get into the three, four, or five meters a second ranges in velocity, um, you're going to get quite a lot of turbulence, as Janice mentioned, um, a lot of air bubbles, cavitation, that sort of thing. It's really going to depend on your sight and you know standing waves, that sort of thing. So um, right. you'll just have to kind of play it by ear when you get to the site and, and see how it goes. Yeah, five meters a second, but always sight dependent. Yeah. Um, can velocity indexing handle hysteresis and how? Um, the answer is no, not really. These are sort of two separate things, two separate um, processing techniques, I would say. Velocity indexing is a well-defined uh, method and a procedure by which we develop these coefficients. Um, hysteresis, I, I would say, is a, just a broader category of of research of the effect of velocity uh, and over time and the, st the, the interrelationship between that and the stage mm -hmm. and the discharge and well what if you could uh, develop a series of coefficients or procedure to, to churn out an answer the way velocity indexing does. Uh, so they're two separate things and maybe that kind of relates to this other question which was Oh, which agencies are using velocity for prediction? Uh, and the answer is we're, we're sort of accumulating data. We're, we're actually starting a discussion on this. I don't think there are many people out there 
actively implementing um, hysteresis in their their warning systems and their monitoring systems. Mm -hmm. But uh, Marion Mustay at the University of Iowa, who um, uh, who Shua uh, who Shua, Shua presented his work in that inundation map, for example, mm -hmm. is working on this, and others at the University of Iowa, for example, mm -hmm. are working on this. Mm -hmm. And on that note, Janice, I just wanted to mention that um, Dr. Mustay is actually looking into the effects of three different uh, types of processing. So first of all, you just use your stage discharge relationship. Next, you use your velocity indexing. And the third method that some people will use, it's more complex, but it's, some of you may have heard of it, it's called the slope area method. Mm -hmm. And so he's actually publishing a couple of papers, there are a couple out already, that uh, we can send out references to uh, at the end of this. Um, but basically, they describe the effect of hysteresis on these different methods. Mm. So there's actually a way to quantify the effect. Wow. And especially for the stage area or rating curve relationships, you can actually correct for the hysteresis to some extent, just using theory mm -hmm. um, in that way. So just wanted to throw that out there. Right. We even hope to maybe even do another webinar and um, do more work on this too. Mm -hmm. This might be kind of related. Let's take this one here. Um, when water level rises, how do you position the side looker? So that is, um, that's a good question because it really, it kind of illustrates some of the pros and cons of using a side looker that was in the China example uh, and uh, one of the Hurricane Irma examples. So the side looker is pretty much uh, positioned at one position and it stays that way even during a flood. Well, obviously what happens is that, you know, if in a normal uh, flood stage, it sits at a certain uh, uh, a fraction of the water depth. When it, the water floods, it's no longer at that same fraction. Perhaps the assumptions you were making and the coefficients you were using uh, to equate the velocity to the overall discharge may not be the same anymore. So if you do see a massive water level rise, that's just an area of uncertainty in your side looker. If you do velocity indexing, like Shua was uh, presenting earlier, that will help tighten up that, those uncertainty and, and eliminate some of those errors um, going out over different stages and different conditions with, say, a river surveyor instrument, and then uh, correlating your observed velocity from the side looker with that. So um, if, it's all, if it's at all possible, it's also an option to put an up looker in uh, the water body because the uplooker, especially the intelligent ones like the IQ, will automatically detect the changing water level and using that same smart pulse algorithm, adapt on the fly and you'll still get a full velocity profile, um, usually in the center of the channel. We still recommend you do indexing if possible uh, on those. You know, it's, again, every site is different. Some sites might take the information from the IQ, handle it well, others might need velocity uh, indexing. Um, oh, and, and, and uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about side lookers in particular, uh, when you're doing velocity indexing, you know, you might want to play around too. It doesn't always have to be the same uh, beginning and end measurement location. Uh, often what we do, especially when first developing a rating, is to get very high resolution cellular d cell data and then combine them, uh, segment them, see which portion of the river most accurately or steadily represents mm -hmm. the whole. Uh, so uh, when you get started, especially with a side looker, that's a very useful um, uh, method to use. Mm -hmm to sort of overcome these, these, these problems. Mm -hmm. um, next question, how to use a hydro board without a bridge? Is it possible during a flooding event? Uh, so it is possible to use a hydro board without a bridge. You may have to um, think of some creative ways to get some tag lines or, or cabling from one side of the river to another. I've seen, you know, you attach it to a rock and throw it over if you can make it. You can use a, an arrow even. Mm -hmm. um, 
that sort of thing. And if you have one person on one bank and another person on another one with the hydro board you know, tied in the middle, then these two people can work together to bring the hydro board back and forth. Mm -hmm. There are also remote boat opportunities. Um, there are many you know, sort of uh, remote controlled boats available mm -hmm. on the market. We mentioned the torrent board which can be outfitted with motors and a remote controlled system. Uh, that's called the RQ Pod, and it's manufactured by Xylem UK, so that's also one possibility. Um, it, so to answer the question of, you know, uh, is this possible during a flood event? Um, as Janice mentioned, and as you've seen, is it's always a greater risk during a flooding event, just because of the turbulence and the high velocities, and so and debris. Yeah, and debris, and so a cableway system. Whenever you have something in the water, you just have to be extra vigilant. And, and make sure that you, your nose doesn't dive down into the water, uh, but that um, you're not you know, flying like a kite, mm -hmm. <laughs> as you mentioned. So it's, it just takes extra care and extra planning, as Janice said, but mm -hmm. um, definitely achievable without a bridge in a flooding event. I, I think it's, it's important to note, too, that remote boats are a great option, and they're getting better and better. Um, but there's usually the motors have uh, only a certain ability so you know if you're having a, just a lot of water but it's just sort of moving in at a, at a slower rate versus flash flooding uh, you know in some cases no motor might be able to keep you on station or even overcome that those high velocities so just be cognizant of that too mm -hmm. when you're selecting a boat yeah. uh, here's another question can the instrument measure velocity at high altitude, indexing um, lakes over 4,500, a mean altitude above sea level, I mm -hmm. assume that's what yeah. that means? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the short answer is yes. I, I've, maybe I'm uh, misunderstanding the question, but I, I, I haven't heard of any restrictions on altitude when we use our instruments. Mm -hmm. I would say um, the instruments that have the pressure sensors in them uh, would need to be calibrated if you move an instrument to a higher altitude, or certainly for, they come here from the factory in San Diego, they're calibrated almost at sea level, so you take it into the high altitude, you would recalibrate it. But other than that, the acoustics underwater work the same way, um, so I wouldn't have any concerns over uh, high altitude or in, in lakes at, at high altitude, which I think is what the question is getting at. Hmm. Um, it's, you know, some alpine lakes, I mean, the probably while we're talking about use in high altitudes in alpine lakes, uh, the, probably the bigger issue is going to be scattering conditions because we didn't get into the big acoustic theory here in this webinar, but the instruments need some amount of sedimentation or biological material or something to, for the signal to bounce off of. Uh, to receive that acoustic echo and if the water is really clear as it can sometimes be in the mountains uh, you might have trouble getting range. Mm -hmm. um, the data is likely to still be accurate for a range just m that signal might not be able to penetrate super clear water. Mm -hmm. So that I would say is the bigger concern. Uh, and if we didn't understand it uh, just uh, please uh, ask the question again and, and we'll uh, answer it in our uh, document. Q&A document. Well, thanks everybody for your questions and thanks for participating in the webinar today. I know Shua and I had a lot of fun putting it together and, and talking about this topic because it's very timely and relevant. So um, take another look at the Rodeo uh, website, the conference and rodeo website, and uh, stay in touch. Thanks everybody. Thank you.